chatting about this because I think sometimes we can be sitting in this room right now and we could say, you know, find Jesus and preach Jesus. And we can all go, amen, that's good. Yeah, yeah. But then what I'm learning is that a lot of people leave the room and they have no idea what that actually means. So if I'm writing to Judah, I'm looking for Jesus here in this wrestling passage of, of Jacob. Help me out. Um, maybe we can try to give a couple more handles for those of us that are teaching the word and preaching what we mean by that because, you know, I'm over and over again telling our church, you know, all 66 books, every chapter, every verse, it's all about one name, the name of Jesus, and everyone shouts and everyone cheers, but then I've got a sense that people still in our church are going home and they're reading things out of context, not through that filter. Um, for instance, when we say this idea of look for Jesus, and I'm by no means even the master of it. I'm speaking that out loud to challenge myself that this whole book is a is God's redemption story. This whole this whole Bible is God's rescue plan, and that's why the whole Bible. It's like it's funny how we read it. Like we all we read it is in these little spurts, right? These little moments, but it's one big story. It's 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 a redemption story. And this in January we did a book study on the book of Esther. Esther is an interesting book in the Bible. There's ten chapters, and not one time is the name of God even mentioned. And it's been quoted many times that, you know, his name is never mentioned, but his fingerprints, you know, they're all over the story. <laughs> I love that. And really, though, as you're reading the story, Esther, she's what we call a type of Christ. That Esther, what she's doing is she's foreshadowing her narrative and her story, her foreshadowing that she's risking her life. That's what she does. If I perish, I, you know, if I perish, I perish. And she's going to the king, and she is risking her life to be killed for her people. And what we're seeing is we're seeing a foreshadow that there's a Jesus to come who won't just risk his life, but, but lay down his life. Now, all of a sudden, when you preach Esther, you're not just going, you're here for such a time as this. Your close is not just, come on, who's willing to risk their life forever for somebody else? You're actually saying, come on, you're here for such a time as this because Jesus, he has died he was buried, but he resurrected in the same power that conquered death, hell, and the grave. It now lives inside of you. And so now when I read Esther, I can actually give all praise and glory to Jesus. Does that make, does that make sense a little bit? And I was just wondering if you have any other maybe just thoughts or phrases when we're, when we're saying like the filter of Jesus, what are those handles for these teachers and preachers, especially when they're in the Old Testament, if they're spending time over there, how can they introduce Jesus? So like recently I did uh, some sermons just online. We filmed it at the house uh, for, for the app for this summer. And um, we, we look, looked at the story of Jacob, Sarah, Leah, right? He ends up having, having two wives and um, Jacob works for his, his, his future father-in-law, I forget his name. And remember he works, what's that, Layman? Yeah, that's right. Laban, uh, Laban, Laban. Um, so I, he said, I thought he said Laban. I was like, yeah, yeah, Laban. Like, wasn't even right. It's Laban. But anyways, um, fake it till you make it. But uh, Jacob works seven years, right? He gets, he gets Leah to his shock, works another seven years. Here's a sermon you could preach. It wouldn't be good, but you could. You could be like, see, when you're in love, you can work. See, you see, it was in those seven years were like a day. When you're in love with Jesus, you'll work for him. You won't even, it won't even be a problem. You'll get up every morning and you'll pray. You'll read your Bible every day. You'll be an evangelist. You'll tell you, you'll just set your school on fire. When you're in love with Jesus, that work wasn't nothing for Jacob. He didn't work for one woman. He worked for two women. He didn't get jaded. He didn't get on for, you know, and, and you gotta work. Come on, we gotta put in the work. People want results, but they don't wanna work. Touch three people and say, work it, work it, work it, work it, right? Like, <laughs> Here's the problem. It was seven years. The number seven is the number of completion, perfection. Jesus is the completion. Jesus is the perfection. Now, now take this passage and you have to go to New Testament teaching, right? Hermeneutical, right? Hermeneutics is the interpretation of scripture and the filter is the cross. So you can lean on a lot of Paul's teachings, which is at least half of the New Testament, right? So we know, for instance, Jesus says, one of his primary teachings, we can get to some of Paul's teachings. Paul says, cast your cares on him because he cares for you. Actually, I think that's John or Peter, Peter. Um, Jesus says this, all you who are weary, heavy laden, burn out on religion, tired, tired of working, tired of tempting, tired, tired, come to me. And I'll show you how to take a real rest. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. So hold on a second. You're preaching a sermon on work, which is great, right? And nobody wants to work in this generation. We gotta work, right? But Jesus teaches a whole different kind of work. So Jacob's labor 
is not actually to be celebrated as much as it's to point us to a new kind of labor and a new kind of work that Jesus does for us and now welcomes us into. So life isn't really about the hard work. That's not really the message, right? The message is actually Jesus. The message is, and, and I could get into more of what I think it is and why I think Leah is in the story, and, and I preached a sermon on it recently, but it's all about Jesus. And so here, my, here, my point is this, Rich, to, to your point, is you look at a scripture like a passage like Jacob, Leah, Sarah, and the whole story, and then you, you go to the New Testament, and you've got to ensure that you're walking it through correct doctrine. And that's what we're not doing. We're taking stories like, you know, pick up your sling and slay your giant. But that's not the story anymore. He had five smooth stones. The story is grace. Jesus is the champion. He will conquer Goliath. Stand still and see the salvation of your God. God will do for you what you cannot do for yourself. That leads us all the way back to Jesus. Jesus says it is finished. Jesus did for us what we could not do for ourselves. Now we don't conquer our Goliath. We can't conquer Goliath. Goliath is a picture of the law. He's the great champion of the ages. He's dominated humanity. He, he makes us feel embarrassed. He makes us feel less than adequate. We can't measure up. We're not tall enough. We're not strong enough. We're not big enough. We can't believe enough. We're doomed. We're screwed. Oh no. And then here comes our champion, right? And he's the seed of David. He's from the long lineage of David and he is the great champion. David is a type of Christ who slays the ultimate Goliath, which is death, hell, and the grave, sin, and the law, right? So 